That being said, we're sitting here, Matthew chapter 25. So I know it sounds like I'm just going to continue, but I am going to give a little bit of the resurrection. I wanted to start actually uh, a little bit talking about that. Happy Resurrection Day. You know, the resurrection isn't just about Jesus' victory over death, right? It's not about that at all, just that, but it's also about our hope, you know, as believers for eternal life. You know, let me give you some scriptures about this. You know, at the very beginning, when the women, you know, they went to go to the grave that morning, and uh, they saw an angel, and the angel was kind of fearful to, you know, they, they were fearful of the angel. You know, and in Matthew chapter 28, verses 5 through 8, it says, But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. You know, Paul sat there and said, you know, about this resurrection, about this day, he said to the Corinthians in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Verses 3 and 4, he says, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. That means it was the most important thing. This, the resurrection, is the most important. He says that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He was raised the third day according to the Scriptures. So those were the most important things that that Paul felt like he said, that's what I received of first importance. You know, so what is the significance of that resurrection, of the resurrection? Romans, uh, Paul says to to Romans, he says in uh, Romans chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, he says, Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead, By the glory of the Father, even so, we should also walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So that's telling you, brothers and sisters, those of us who believe, we're going to be in his same likeness, just as he raised, just as he was, when when we go up to that and are baptized, we're baptized into that death, right? We're baptized. And, and yet when we come back up, we should walk into this newness of life. For we had not only been united in his death, right? Being brought down, but when we come back up, we are raised just, and we'll be just like him. You know, he, he also, Paul said to the uh, church of Corinthians, again, he said in 15, 20 through uh, chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20, through 22, he says, But now Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since a man came, for since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. So Adam at the very beginning, the death came by him. By his sin. And that's what came to all of, all man. All mankind comes death. But Christ, our God, came to this earth and became flesh for us that we may all rise again. You know, it was by man that it that it came, that death came. And it will be by man that he came and we will be raised. That's why he had to come. He had to prove and show that we we were uh, that that he was the only one able to defeat death. So then we have a hope 
and a promise. And that hope and promise is of the resurrection to us believers. You know, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 and 14 says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. You know, that reminds me of something that, you know, and, and this is, I don't really remember dreams much, and I'm not saying that this is a, a, a big dream, but you know something? I have hope that I, you know, I'll see my loved ones again. Well, I had a dream last night, and I guess thinking about this, and I had a dream that I saw my Uncle Truett, and I saw my Uncle Joe, and I even saw my grandfather. And we were, we were at a church-like service, and I was fixing to stand up, and I was just like I'm preparing today, just like I, I come up in here, but when the people started coming in, it was my loved ones. And they were young again. They weren't, I didn't really recognize them. And it was just like, maybe it was just the Lord give me that dream. And so that was something that just happened last night. Wasn't planned on putting in here. But it was just a dream and it was just a, a, a brief second. And I still remember that in my head. And, 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 and there was many people all the way through. And so, you know, it's just something. And so that is our hope, though, that we will see him, see our loved ones again, you know, that we will see them again. You know, uh, John talked about what our Lord said. And he said that to uh, Martha, right, when Lazarus had died. In John chapter 11, verses 23 through 27, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Do you remember that right there reminds me, that's what Peter said to, to Jesus when, when he went up there and he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, right? And, and Jesus says that, you know, flesh and blood didn't give you this, but my Father who is in heaven who told you this. So there's a promise for us believers that we will see all those who believe. That's why it's so important that you, 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 you witness to your loved ones and your family and your friends. You know, and you, you know the hope that lies within you. You have a, an answer to give to them. You know, so that they, because I, I, I long to see those. So the future of the resurrection. You know, the resurrection is not a New Testament thing. Daniel talked about it. And it will lead us into what we were talking about with the marriage supper of the Lamb. You know, and the, and the bridesmaids and, and, the, and the, uh, the ten virgins. But let's read right here, Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. He says, At that time... Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands, watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never, such as never was since there was a nation. Does that remind you of something we've been reading lately? We've been studying in Matthew chapter 24. Even to that time, and at that time your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. And then verse 2 says, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake, some to everlasting life, 
and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn away, turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and forever and ever. You know, when it talks about this is a part of that resurrection, he's saying they will rise. Those that sleep shall rise and shall wake, some into everlasting life, but some into everlasting contentment. And we don't want to see any of our loved ones in that place. So as we sit here and we remember this, this takes us right on into what we were talking about. Matthew chapter, now we're in Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. It's the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins, right? And this goes on with the same, just because there's a chapter difference right there. A lot of people want to read into this as being a little bit different than, you know, as I've been saying, it's still the same context of what Jesus was talking about earlier with, you know, sitting there with the disciples asked that question. You remember those three questions that he had asked? He says, you know, the first he talks about the temple being destroyed. He says, not one stone will be left upon another. And then he turns around and they ask him, they think this has got to be like the end Right? Because here's the temple getting destroyed. And so they ask him, so when will these things be? And what will be the time of your coming? And what will be the time of the end? And so Jesus is still talking about these. He's, in fact, trying to drive home. And he's given many things. And so when we read this parable of the wise and the foolish versions, it's actually about the whole wedding ceremony that happens with the Jewish people, that custom in that time. And we'll go through some of that. But let's read Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. He says, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. At the mid, at, and at midnight, a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming to go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should be not, be not enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor hour which the Son of Man is coming. So you see here, Jesus, just like I said, as we've been reading earlier, said that that day would come and it would re require them to be ready, to be vigilant and prepared, right, for that day. Especially on those days. You know, throughout Matthew 24, he talked about watching, you know, the signs. He told about all the signs that he would be, to watch for those signs and his coming. Emphasizing the importance, the importance to be ready, right? At all times. He used various metaphors. We've talked about those metaphors. You know, remember the fig tree and it, it putting on the, you know, as it bloomed, the tender shoots come out. And you knew that, by looking at that, and he said even all the trees, that summer, you know, spring is coming and summer is at hand, right? And that's a, a, another illustration of discernment, you know, and understanding the times. Do you remember the homeowner? How he sit there and he said that he would stay awake to prevent that thief from coming in. You know, because he was watching. 
He said, how, you know, that if, if the homeowner didn't know, I mean, he would have went to sleep, but because he knew he should stay awake, at least the thief break in. So too is this spiritual readiness for those at that time. For the Son of Man will come in an hour that you don't expect. So you see that it's the same, it's going on the same idea, the same path. Now here, Matthew is calling for that watchfulness, and he continues to talk about his second coming right here. You know, when I talked about that wedding, you remember that wedding that we were talking about and, and how that wedding procession done? So let me explain to some of what it did. So it, you had a betrothal, the very first part of it. It says the wedding process began with a betrothal, a legal Bind, legally binding agreement between the bride and the groom's family. Unlike modern engagements, betrothal in ancient times was legally binding as married itself. It, the couple was considered married but yet did not live together or consummate the marriage. This period could last for several months, even up to a year, symbolizing the commitment between the bride and the groom and each, you know, between each other. So to give you an idea, and, and so I went into the NIV because it, the way it says it, I, I, I wanted to, the way it said it, the, the way they had interpreted, but it means the same in, in the uh, New King James Version or the King James Version. But Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, let me read this. It says, now, th this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. So you see that marriage betrayal, that was, you know, the, 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 the I'm saying that wrong, but, but, but I can't say it right now. For some reason, I can't say betrothal, okay? But <laughs> I just said it. Anyways, you see that it was even shown that that was a part of the ritual that was there by looking at Mary and Joseph. And so that's one of the reasons why I wanted to bring this up to you. So there was a preparation period, right? During the betrothal, the groom prepared a place for his future wife often adding a room to his father's house. You know, that reminds me right there is where Jesus sits there and he says to his disciples, do you not know I've gone to prepare a place? I'm going to prepare a place. If it's not so, I wouldn't there. In my father's house, there are many mansions, which is rooms. So there's many rooms that he prepared for us. So anyways, that was just something on the side. That's, that's uh, not the idea of the story right now but the bride meanwhile prepares her wedding garments and the items that she would bring into the marriage this period of preparation echoes the need for that spiritual readiness right and highlights this right here in that parable of the 10 versions so when you think about this it says at you know when we looked at back back at the the uh at what we're talking about at the mid at and at midnight, a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. And then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, right? You know, they were supposed to already be ready. They were supposed to be ready for that. And yet the foolish said to the wise, Give us some oil. See, they weren't ready. And so there was always this pre preparation that should have been already prepared. And during that time, you know, so the wedding procession, is a the wedding ceremony itself started with the groom. It says, accompanied by his friends, was going into the bride's home, going to the bride's home to bring her to his own home or to a place prepared for the wedding feast. This procession often took place at night, illuminated by torches or lamps carried by the wedding party, which directly, you know, parallels this right here, this story right here of the virgins and the lamps and the peril. You know, the timing of the groom's arrival was deliberately kept uncertain. 
They didn't want it. The tradition that tested the readiness and prepare and, and pay, readiness and patience of the bride and her attendants. The bridesmaids or virgins needed to have their lamps ready whenever the groom arrives, emphasizing the theme of vigilance, you know, of vigilance and preparedness, right? And what did they say? What did the what, what did they say? Give us some of your oil, for ours go out. But the wise said, No, at least there not be enough for you and us us but go rather to those who sell it see they should have already went there should have already been ready but you see this 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 wedding now can you imagine that at the midnight this is this is a part of it now we see a little bit of in our basic weddings today is where we have bridesmaids and we have those but but at that time i mean that would have probably been a very beautiful you know way of doing things just that that marriage i could just imagine and could you imagine all of you guys could you imagine when you when your 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 daughter or or your son you know is getting married how how that would have to be and you'd have to be ready for that at any moment that he just says hey it's time and so that's sort of that same idea of what we as christians should be ready at any moment you know that's why we go out and we talk to people, but but that's not really it's th this part. Again, I want to emphasize is that it's about that time and that day, right? The signs and the time of the things. So we'll talk about that more. The marriage feast, right? And then we're going to talk about the marriage. Upon arriving at the groom's home, the bride and the groom would participate in a marriage feast, which could last for several days. This feast was a time of great joy and celebration attended by many guests. The marriage feast or the marriage supper of the Lamb symbolizes an intimate and joyous fellowship between Christ and the, His redeemed church. Celebrating their union and the fulfillment of God's redemptive plan. You know, it's a time of joy and celebration, you know, and the consummation when all the believers will be in relationship, you know, will, will be reunited with Christ. You know, Paul says this a little bit. When we think about it this way, Paul says to Ephesians chapter, you know, if you wanted to turn to chapter to Ephesians chapter five, verses 25 through 33. And he talks about husbands and wives and how husbands and wives should treat each other. He says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water of the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife, or loves his wife, loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourished it and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bone. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you participate so love his own wife, particularly so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that he, she respects her husband. So when you think about it, he's presenting, you know, as Christ loved the church, this bride and this groom, right? And just looking at that, he says he, that he might present her to himself as a glorious church, right? Not having spot or blemish. So, you know, the, but that's the preparedness that we are through the washing of the word, right? Right? We should go, it says that, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water of the word. That means read your Bible. Learn what it says. Stay in it. 
you know? And this was a great mystery, and this is still a great mystery. The whole concept of eternal life and what we have and the whole concept of how God's going to ultimately end our earth, end, our, end this time period, not our earth, because it's not the end of our earth. It's the end of an age going into the millennial that we see. And so this is also concerning the same way he's trying to, to give us an idea. So it's a great mystery, and Paul knows that mystery of what Jesus is trying to say here. You know, and that reminds me when you think about it. It reminds me, just takes me back a little bit further. You remember we were talking when, uh, when we had about the, uh, uh, let me try to say it, the, the, the king, the marriage, the feast that was happening. And we did that in Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. I want to read that with you again because this has a lot to do with this too. It says, And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. And he sent out the servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, but they were not willing to come. I want to stop right there. And one of the things that I, I sit there and I think of straight to that where, where they're not willing to come was what did, he, what did Jesus say? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long for you, for you to, to gather you together, but you were not willing, right? So right here he says, for they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out his other servants, saying to those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, and my oxen and my fatted cattle are killed. And these, all these things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, others to his business. And the rest seized his servants and treated them spitefully and killed them. Does that remember remind you? Old Jerusalem, those who kill the prophets, right? He's sitting here basically saying this to earlier. He was talking about this too. He said, but when the king heard about it, he was furious and sent out his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. And that's exactly what happened in AD 70 with Jerusalem. He went out and he, he destroyed that city. He destroyed the temple. He left that house unto them desolate, is what he said. I, you know, when he walked out at the beginning, he says, see that I left your house. You know, all before he was talking about my father's house, right? And now he says, I left leave unto you your house desolate, right? And so, and then his servants, then he said to his servant, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited, were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out to the highways and gathered together all those, all, together, all of whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. Right there tells you that it doesn't matter whether you're good and bad. Doesn't, that's not what gets you in there. You, you were all called. And this is, represents basically the, the, the Gentiles coming into this part at that time. Now when he says, verse 11, he says, But when the king came to see the, the guest, he saw a man who did not have a wedding garment on. And he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. So what was that wedding garment? Do you think he just threw him out because he just didn't have on the proper clothes? Well, in a way, it wasn't just that. But he's talking about the proper clothes. It was righteousness. He was come in in his own righteousness. And that doesn't get you there. You can't be good enough to go in there. You have to have the righteousness of Christ. And that was what that meant. And that's the same thing for these people in that day. When they come to this wedding feast, their righteousness is not going to be their own righteousness by following the law. 
Their righteousness is going to be God's righteousness that covers them. And so that's part of what's speaking. And that's, what, that's what's right there. That's what, he's, that's what he, he has. You have to have that. If you don't have that, you'll be thrown into it. And you think you're prepared, but you're not. You see, you got your lamp, but you don't have your oil. So you have to be prepared. And this is for those people at that time, right? Now, right now, you know, the, the, you know let, me, let me continue. Let me continue instead of getting off track. So the role of the virgins. The virgins or bridesmaid in the parable can see, be seen as playing a role similar to that of friends or attendants in an ancient wedding who had the duty of welcoming the groom with lit lamps and participating in the procession. Their readiness with the oil in the lamps was crucial for participating in festivals, just as spiritual readiness is essential for participating in the kingdom of God, especially on that day of Jacob's trouble. We were talking about that. That's what that whole seven years. They need to be... Realize they need to see the signs that's happening. And then they need to realize, because they can, you may think you make it all the way through the tribulation. But at the end of that day, he's going to come and he's going to separate. That's what we just went through. That sounded so much like the rapture. But he's going to have his angels take and bind up those tares and cast them out into the fire. Even though they made it through that tribulation time, they still are going to be cast out because they didn't have their oil for their lamps. Right? They weren't ready. They weren't prepared. Their own righteousness isn't going to get them there. They have to trust in God during this time. And that goes for everybody on that world, on the world. You know, at that time, we will be right up there in heaven during that seven years. We have that other hope that we're going to be go to him. You know, Matthew chapter 25, and it says, While they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. You know, when I look at that, the door was shut. What does that also remind you? And that's what our Christ, our Lord, also reminded us, just as in the days of Noah, right? You remember that? He said, just as in the days of Noah. Well, that, let me read that part of that just in that day of Noah, when Noah, when Noah entered into that ark. And it says in uh, Genesis chapter 7, verse 16, it says, So those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. The door was shut. That was the finality of that, right? The moment the door shuts carries a profound theological implications right here. It symbolizes the finality of God's judgment, separating those who are to be saved from those who will face the consequences of their actions. The theme of divine judgment and salvation is echoed in other biblical narratives you know, that we're just now reading right here. This is the same thing, including the parable of the foolish virgins, right? This parable, the bridegroom arrives unexpectedly, right? The, the wise virgins that were prepared entered in. They had the oil. They had their lamp. But the foolish ones, you know, they were outside. And later on when they came knocking, they let us in. What did he say? He says, I don't know you. You weren't, you, you didn't do, I don't know you. Both narratives, Noah and the ark and the parable of the wild, emphasize the importance of readiness. So those people on that day will have to be ready. And now what is being ready? Trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Trusting even though they ha aren't the... There will be many people missing and disappeared on this face of this earth because the rapture will come. You know, now you can go right now 
If you trust in Him. But we know there's, not going, to, there's going to be people that don't trust. And we know there's going to be people at that time. Because this Word right here tells us this is going to happen. You know, just like Jesus told the, just like Jesus told the Pharisees and Sadducees, if they had believed Moses, they would believe and look for His day coming. I believe what this Word says. You have to believe it. If you don't believe it, then you're going to say, I don't know, whatever, I don't know. And then you're going to be ones that will be left. You don't want to be that one that's been left, nor do you want to be the one that's taken off when you see all these other signs coming about. You don't want to be the ones that's gathered up by the angels at the end of the age as the tares and cast into the fire. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor hour which the Son of Man cometh. Let me show you what John Wolverd said. John Wolverd said uh, in the book, Matthew, the kingdom come, the illustration presumes that the legal marriage has already taken place and can reasonably be identified with the marriage of Christ and the church already consummated in the rapture. When Christ returns at his second coming, he will bring with him with bring the bride with him. The five virgins who bring oil in their vessels illustrate those who are ready for his return. The five foolish maidens, although outwardly prepared, they had their lamp. Right? They were not really ready. They were not really ready. And when the time comes for the marriage feast, they are not prepared to enter into the procession and join the feast. And so they'll be cast out. They'll be left out. The door is shut. And they won't be able to go in. You know, to give you a, a, a picture of this, Revelations chapter 19, 6 through 9 says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and as a sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and His wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Verse 9 says, Then he said, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So that asked me the question. Anybody who's listening to this now, they can go in and be the bride. That's what the church is, the bride of Christ. And they can go there now. If you don't know Him, you can go now. In that day, if you choose not to go now, in that day, are you going to be a wise virgin? Or are you going to be a foolish one? That's the whole thing that the question is. He says... Right here, the, he, the angel said to John, he says, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. See, he says, let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and His wife has made, him, made herself ready. But then later on, he talks about those who are called to the marriage. I would say... Be the bride. But like I said, we know there's many who's not going to listen to that. And so, be the wise virgin. Prepare yourself. Understand the times that's there. 
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for everything you've given us, for your word, Lord, for everything you've said in your word, for helping us, Lord, to understand those things, to understand those words, to understand as they go, Lord. Lord, not only, only that, but just thank you for rising. Today was the day of that we have hope. You know, it, it, there's going to be those who rise and those that rise into everlasting joy and those who rise to everlasting contentment. Lord, we love you and we thank you. Please let everybody who hears my voice be those that rise to everlasting joy. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.